So similar to Kobe, we'll talk a little bit about the background, the PRMS, the major principles and definitions. We'll get into the guidelines, estimating verbal quantities, and I'll talk a little bit about, similar to Kobe Line 2 and Line 3, there's some supplemental document PRMS. So reference materials, so there's the two major documents that uh, if you're getting familiar with PRMS, you're going to want to read. There's the Petroleum Resources Management System which is PRMS, and then there's a document called the Practical Application of PRMS. And so the Practical Application is much like Kogi Volume 2, where it goes into a lot more detail than the actual PRMS guidance. So just to give you a rough comparison, Kogi Volume 1 is about 280 pages front to back. PRMS has about 30 pages of documentation. Uh, in the actual document before it gets into glossaries and appendixes. So PRMS is virtually the same in terms of definitions, but it is much more brief and it's much less comprehensive than Kogi. Uh, Kogi Volume 2 is another 300 pages and the PRMS practical application is about 250 pages. So the practical application of PRMS is really the detailed and and comprehensive guide for how to evaluate reserves and resources, but it's not actually incorporated in when the SEC or the ASAC, the Australian Stock Exchange, when they reference PRMS, they're really only referencing the initial document, which is the definitions in the 30 pages I was talking about. So again, from a high level, Kogi is much more detailed in its original volume, whereas the original PRMS was much more brief. So the real challenge, the resources are in this range, everyone wants the answer. The real problem with reserves, as we were talking about, is there's no one answer. The only thing you really know when you're evaluating reserves is that you're going to be wrong, and the only question is how wrong are you going to be. So that's really why these guidelines can't be too specific, and be why they're such high, or sorry, such high levels of uncertainty with reserves and resource volumes. So taking a step back and looking at who uses reserve reports in North America and throughout the world, we got government agencies such as yourself who are using them to determine national reserves and, and resources, financial organizations who use them for diligence and backing for loaning capital investments, securities regulators and investors, so that's public stakeholders for publicly traded companies, and oil and gas codes, uh, which could be national oil companies, or could be independents and privates. All of these stakeholders want the same thing. They want reliable information on cash flows through the full life recovery of the asset. So what are they used for? Internal business decisions, public reporting requirements, government reporting, mergers and acquisitions, project financing, and resource study. So much about what we talked before, that's really what PRMS is designed around, is figuring out a standardized evaluation method for these types of purposes. So internally, PRMS really focuses on providing that range. You're going to have a best case estimate, and it's going to, the range is going to give you an idea of what the high and low could be. It includes all classes of resources, prospective contingent and reserves and it's used as an input into portfolio management decision. This is really how companies decide where they're going to deploy their capital. If a company has 100 properties, the reserves evaluation is often a starting point for how they should deploy their, their development account amongst those properties. Regulatory reporting, stock exchanges like we've talked about, governments and national oil companies and industries, all these have very stringent reporting guidelines to make sure they're getting similar information from all the companies who are reporting to them. Project financing, this is the banks, collateral for loans. The banks generally focus on the conservative estimate. They do their best to be very conservative when they're loaning up capital. So when we're dealing with clients that are going to loans, the focus is usually on approved and often on just proved developed producing reserves because that's where the banks really calculate their leverage ratios for how much capital they're willing to give a company. So the scope of projects, this is just showing you that PRMS is really a full life cycle. And so Kobe, it's a full life cycle guide. So it starts from prospects, goes all the way to drilling, discovery, field optimization, enhanced recovery, and eventually it deals with abandonment and sellage. PRMS is designed so that it is applicable in all stages of an asset's life. So major principles, just sort of summarizing PRMS, the system's project-based, talked a bit about that. 
Classification is based on chance of commerciality. Categorization is based on recoverable uncertainty. So again, that's that vertical and horizontal axes on, on the box we were looking at earlier. Classification and categorization. Base case uses evaluators forecast the future conditions. So that's that's talking about forecast price and costs. It's talking about it's not constant, it's escalated moving forward, and it's based on the evaluator's best estimate. Deterministic and or probabilistic methods applies to conventional and unconventional resources, and reserved resources are estimated in terms of sales products. So one of the things that we haven't really touched on very much so far is that part of, because they're so tied to commerciality and, and economics, reserves can only be disclosed at a certain sales point. So you're going to have a reference point for each product or sales and you can only disclose what actually what the company actually sells so where that comes into account is when you get into things like fuel gas shrinkage byproducts that may or may not be extracted from the gas stream you're only allowed to disclose as reserved volumes whatever you actually sell to market you're not allowed to disclose anything that does not get sold that gets used by your company it has to be sales product. So this is another look at that same McKelvey box. You got your categories left to right, proved, probable, possible, low, best, high, prospective, contingent resources. And really what this, what the arrows are telling you is, is the whole purpose of evaluations, the whole purpose of shifting reserves and resource categories is to try and move up left of the chart. That's really what you're trying to get to, to increase the certainty or up into the middle of the chart in, in terms of your best estimate. But you're, you're really, the focus by most of the stakeholders out there is going to be in the top left quadrant of that chart. So talking a bit more about a project, like I said, PRMS is, is a lot more definitive about the project system. Project represents the link between the accumulation and the decision-making progress process, including budget allocation. So it could be as simple as development of a single well, or it could be a number of fields and associated facilities. Characterized by investment costs, and most of the rest of it is just talking about the different stages of a project. But basically, what it's getting at is that a project needs to be well-defined if, you, if you're going to be evaluating it. And so it's really, a project is defined by the asset base and the inputs that the company is trying to develop. So a decision to proceed with a project requires all future costs, estimates of recoverable sales quantities, and range of uncertainty. So this is, this is again, getting into decision making for how a company will internally deploy capital. PRMS encourage consideration of all possible technically feasible opportunities to maximize recovery. So again, it's talking about range. It's talking about PRMS is, is really saying you have to investigate all of the possible outcomes of an asset before you can truly value it. Projects not initially economically viable remain in the resource portfolio, ensuring there remains viable potential of future investments. So what it's saying is, once you finish evaluating a project, and once you decide whether to proceed or not to proceed with it, that doesn't mean, if you decide not to proceed with the project, that doesn't mean it just disappears, it goes away, you never look at it again. The reason we have different classifications of volumes is so that if you do decide that project is not currently viable portfolio, it simply goes into a different bucket, it goes into a different category. And those projects can be revisited at different effect effective dates and they can be binned in different buckets based on the results of the evaluation at those different effective dates. So I don't need to spend much time on this one. Again, up and down, we have risk left and right, we have uncertainty, we've got all of our various volumes on here and this is identical to what you'll find in Kogi. So Kogi and PRMS are exactly the same. Simple definitions are what we talked about at the beginning of the first presentation of Kogi. All definitions as being PRMS and I fit in SEC. Same decision tree, the exact same decision tree we saw for Kogi. Uh, you're looking at whether it's discovered, whether it's recoverable, and whether it's commercial. And based on the answer to those three questions, you're going to end up in one of the big this is kind of a new concept that we didn't talk much about. It's not specific to PRMS. It's the same thing in Kogi, but this is the resource triangle. So at the top of the triangle, you have high quality, high permeability, high porosity reservoirs. Those are the easiest to produce, the most prolific, the highest asset base, uh, sorry, highest asset value. And then as you get decreasing reservoir quality, what happens is you get a much wider range of resources. So there's a lot more of it, but they're a lot harder to produce. So they require a lot more capital. They require 
more technology requirements. So this is getting into you know, at the bottom, we got gas hydrates where we, we don't even have a technology right now that's really economically feasible. But the size of the resource is enormous. Gas hydrates are the biggest hydrocarbon resource on the planet and we can't produce it economically right now. Above that, you got shale gas. I mean, this was just unlocked in the last eight to 10 years. That, more so in the last five years. And it's, a, it's an enormous resource, but it's very expensive to produce. And it took a lot of R&D and technology to unlock it. So it's, a, it's an interesting thought. Uh, the Canadian, Canada was up here for a long time. Western Canadian Sedimentary Basin. This was where we operated. It was our bread and butter for 70, 80 years. And it's only in the last, basically since 2000, that these sorts of resources have really opened up. Uh, part of it is markets and pricing, part of it is the technologies that are available. But slowly we are working our way down the triangle. Canada is running out of the large conventional reservoirs that are easy to produce and, and cheap to produce. And so we're, we're having to find more ways to be competitive with more difficult reservoirs. Uh, suspension of resource, naturally occurring petroleum accumulations. They can be discovered, undiscovered, recovered, unrecoverable, uh, commercial or non-commercial. There's no guarantee a resource will become a reserve. So there's, in terms of moving buckets, if you have prospective resources, there's not necessarily a guarantee they're ever going to be discovered because prospective resources, you don't know if it's actually a hydrocarbon. Um, if you drill that well and you find out that there's no hydrocarbons there, those prospective resources do not become a reserve, a contingent resource or a reserve. So there's never a guarantee, there's always a risk uh, that volumes will never become a reserve until you get past that discovery hurdle and that commerciality. So we already talked about these total petroleum initially in place, that's every molecule, the discovered petroleum initially in place is, is what has been penetrated and known to be hydrocarbon bearing and undiscovered petroleum in place, petroleum in accumulations that have not yet been found. Discovered existence of an accumulation of petroleum has been confirmed. So again, in terms of the specific definitions in both Kogi and PRMS, that's penetrated by a well bore. So discovery can be established through testing, sampling, and or logging the existence of a significant quantity of potentially movable hydrocarbons. So the other interesting concept here is significant quantity. So because of the commerciality requirements, the tiny reservoirs that, that are not likely to produce commercially viable amounts of resources don't qualify as discovered. So if you find a, a tiny, tiny reservoir never produced economically, it, it still sits in the undiscovered bin. Commerciality, we've talked a lot about commerciality. In order to be commercial, it has to meet the evaluator's economic criteria. So that's really talking about, like we talked in Kobe, it's talking about a reasonable rate of return where it can't just be 0% or undiscounted MPV positive. It has to provide some reasonable return. No significant contingencies that would meant development. Reasonable expectation that all approvals will be forthcoming. The intent to develop within a reasonable time frame. And in PRMS, the reasonable time frame depends on specific circumstances and varies according to the scope of the project. Okay, so the next several slides we'll be able to move through fairly quickly because the definitions of contingent prospective reserves are essentially identical in PRMS and COVI. So contingent resources, really known accumulations. It says recoverable is redundant because it's talking about the definition of which known is penetrated and recoverable. Contingent resources, so the specific definition, as we talked about before, petroleum estimated as of a given date to be potentially recoverable from known accumulations. But the caveat is applied projects are not yet mature enough for commercial development due to one or more contingency. Uh, it gives examples of a few contingencies, projects for which there are currently no markets. Commercial recovery is dependent on technology under development. Evaluation of the accumulation is insufficient to clearly assess commerciality. And then it talks about the maturity subclasses that we talked about earlier. So development pending, development on hold, development unclarified. And when we're looking at contingent resources, we pay special attention to project maturity and economic status. So those are kind of the two classifications within contingent resources. And that'll be shown on the slide shortly. So again, the official definition, contingent resources, Estimated as of a given date, potentially recoverable from accumulations using established technology or technology under development, not currently commercially recoverable due to one or more contingencies. So that is identical to the Kogi definition. Typical contingencies you might see, if it's uneconomic, it falls into the contingent resource bucket. If you don't have a market to sell your product, uh, if there's no corporate commitment, 
There's no development schedule within the reasonable time frame or no regulatory approval. The same, this is the same slide from Kogi presentation where contingencies cannot be lack of ownership. You have to own the mineral rights. It can't be a lack of knowledge of properties of the reservoir. So it can't be simply that you don't have enough information and it can't be lack of technology for recovery. So that's all of those volumes fall into unrecoverable. If, if there's, it's like gas hydrates right now, that they're not contingent resources because what's missing is the technology to recover them. Respective resources, again, identical from unknown accumulations, so they have not been discovered, and they have two risks with them, risk of discovery, risk of commerciality. So in terms of classifying undiscovered volumes, it's talking about undiscovered volumes are either gonna be prospective or unrecoverable. And then when it's talking about subdividing in accordance with level, again, that's the project maturity subclass, that's the lead play, you'll see it on a slide. The official definition, exactly the same as the Kogi one, keyword being undiscovered accumulations, and the other key being that they don't restrict the technology. It, it doesn't necessarily have to be a technology under development or an established technology, but you have to have a development project. You have to have a plan for, for developing it. That's why gas hydrates wouldn't, wouldn't fall under prospective resources either because there's no current projects. Uh, examples, these are the same examples that we talked about in Kobe, side economies that have not yet been penetrated. Petroleum a long distance from production or test, that's the shale gas example where you're miles away from the nearest well but you know the zone is present. Outside of Halo, again that's talking about shale gas, shale oil. Discovered petroleum for which no recovery is shown. So that's when you've penetrated a zone, you know there's hydrocarbons there but you're not, you can't prove that it's productive. You can't prove that it's going to be recoverable in commercial rates. Perspective resources, two risk components, discovery and development. Contingent resources, one risk component, chance of development. Both categories should have low, best, and high in a defined development plan. So again, PRMS is talking about ranges. It's talking about uncertainty in those estimates. And the, the company or the project has to have a plan in place that's going back to the whole concept of a project. If you don't have a project and you don't have a development plan, you can't assign contingent or prospective resources. Running into reserves, petroleum recoverable commercially from known accumulations, and recoverable is redundant just because known means discovered and recoverable. So this is, the next few slides are formal definitions right out of PRMS. So it's talking about classes and categories. So again, this is the McKelvey box and moving left to right and up and down. Category describes uncertainty. So that's your proved probable possible or your low best and high. Whereas your class describes the commerciality. That's your resources, reserves, inside resources, contingent or perspective. So this shows the project maturity subclasses straight out of PRMS. This table is slightly different than Kogi, and the only difference is that this box with development unclarified or development on hold is, is a single box in PRMS, and in Kogi it's split into two different categories. It's likely going to be, when they update them later this year, they will be the same. Uh, you got pro prospect lead and play is maturity subclasses for prospective resources, which is based on sort of what level of data acquisition or what level of project development you're in. Contingent resources, you got development pending, development unclarified or on hold, and development not viable, depending on, again, the project status. And reserves on production, if it's on production, approved for development and justified for development, basically talking about the level of corporate commitment in the reserves. Resources versus reserves, everybody's trying to get their volumes to reserves. That's where they start to get recognized in the capital markets and in public disclosures. Resources, there's a few questions Going back to that flow chart that we looked at, is it discovered, is it commercial, and the certainty of the estimates. Reserves have to clear some extra hurdles before they can be classified as reserves. Is the project justified, is it profitable, and is it approved by internal external regulation? So reserves, the official definition, petroleum anticipated to be commercially recoverable by application of development projects to known accumulations from a given date forward under defined conditions. So very, very similar. So these are the actual words out of PRMS and they're slightly different than the Kobe ones, but identical in intent. Reserves are discovered, economic, which is defined as a positive operating margin. They're commercial, they're remaining, they're owned, and they're producible, which includes all of those factors that are listed there, regulatory, contracts, political, environmental factors. Commerciality, 
like I just talked about, political, legal, regulatory, and contractual, all of these conditions have to be met and understood before you can classify volumes as reserves. Essential conditions for commerciality, it has to have positive economics, you have to have evidence of market production and transportation facilities. The same factors we talked about on the last slide for commerciality. You have to have reasonable expectation that it's going to be approved both by government agencies as well as by your internal controls in the company. And you have to have evidence of a reasonable time frame for development. Going back to risk factors, so again, the, the defining difference between reserves and resources is risk. Reserves have no risk associated with them. They have uncertainty, but no risk. There's no, there's no binary uh, switch. There's no chance of failure with reserves. There is a chance of failure for both. There's chance of failure for both perspective and contingent resources. And there's two factors that go into that for perspective resources and only one for contingent. The same comparison table. We've been over this a couple of times now. Again, the keys, potentially recoverable versus commercially recoverable. That's reserves versus resources. Known accumulations versus unknown. That's reserves and contingent versus respect, the type of technology required and the risks associated. Additional classifications, so reserve status, that's where we're getting back into developed, which can be producing or non-producing and undeveloped. The reserve status can be applied to all three categories of reserves, so you can have proved developed, you can have probable developed, you can have possible developed, and the same with undeveloped. Economic status, so there's a slight difference in terminology between PRMS and COE. PRMS calls contingent resources marginal economic or submarginal economic, and that's really in in, in Kogi, it's it's just called economic contingent resources, sub-economic contingent resources. They mean the exact same thing. Marginal economic means it has positive economics. Submarginal economic just means it's it's uneconomic. And reserves obviously have to be economic and economic status. So it's like oh, when you're when you're defining volumes in a report after done evaluation, you can you can tie economic status to the project maturity subclasses, or you can you can break out volumes. So if you looked at, for example, if you had contingent resources in the development pending bucket, you could further classify those contingent resources as economic development pending or sub-economic development. Um, it's just talking about the level of detail you can go to in classifying. Commerciality checklist, we've seen this about six times now, so I won't go through it again. Uh, these are all things you need to be reasonably certain of to assign reserves. Incremental projects, so this is starting to talk about secondary and tertiary processes. There's a section in a short section in PRMS on it. There's more detail on it in the application of PRMS supplementary documents. It talks about work orders, treatments, and changes of equipment and how they should be dealt with in evaluations. Then it talks about the last three compression, infill drilling, and improved recovery. It really talks about how you define incremental volumes versus acceleration of existing volumes. So it gives you some it gives guidance on how to deal with incremental enhanced recovery projects. Unconventional resources. So there's, uh, there's several of these. PRMS, the initial document, the 30 page document, barely touches on most of this. The application of PRMS document goes into quite a bit more detail. Uh, but it does specifically mention uncontrolled resources like CBM, shale gas, hydrates, etc. They require specialized extraction technologies, which we've talked about. and. What PRMS basically says is it identifies that these are evaluated in, in different ways than conventional resources, but it says that PRMS is designed to encompass both conventional and unconventional assets, which is the same as Kogi. They, they tried to make the definitions wide enough or encompassing enough to capture both conventional and unconventional accumulation. Evaluation and reporting guidelines. So while there was a whole section in Kogi on this, there's about three paragraphs in PRMS that are based very high level. They talk about why we reporting guidelines and the guidance for a few different types of reporting guidelines. So this, this goes into detail about when I was talking about sales products, it goes into detail about production measurement portion is what can you disclose? What can't you disclose for shrinkage, fuel loss, 
that kind of stuff. So there's some relatively specific guidance as to what should be included and reported as reserves and what should not. Commercial evaluations, it talks a little bit like this is kind of like the time and profitability section of Cody where it talks a little bit about cash flow based evaluations, what they are, how they're, they're used for. Economic criteria, same as Cody, it says you can use whatever's reasonable, but you have to specifically disclose what you use for economic parameters. And it talks about how to apply an economic limit. Production measurement, like I was talking about a second ago, it talks about reference points, which is the point of sale. So that's where your reserves volumes are going to be reported at. It talks about lease fuel. The reason lease fuel is specifically identified in a few different places is because there's different approaches to how it should be treated. So from a high level backup, so lease fuel is anytime you're you're producing a gas asset or a solution asset and an oil asset, there will be a portion of that gas that gets used up in, in the production operations or flared or lost in the gas gathering infrastructure system. And so lease fuel is essentially, it's a shrinkage. It means you produce a certain amount of raw gas at the wellhead. But by the time it gets to the sales point and it's gone through a bunch of facilities and it might be used as fuel gas or something, there's less gas on the other side. And so Kogi and PRMS say that lease fuel should not be included as resources or sorry, reserves. Kogi is very specific. It says it cannot be. PRMS said in most cases it should not be, but if you choose to disclose it as reserves volumes, you have to adjust your operating costs to account for it. And the SEC says you do report it in your reserves volumes, or at least you can report it in your reserves volumes. Uh, similar to PRMS, you have to account for the losses in your costs. Uh, wet or dry natural gas. So gas can either be, gas has entrained natural gas liquids inside of it, and you can choose to leave them in the gas and sell a higher heating value gas for a higher price, or you can choose to process the gas, remove the liquids, and sell them. So this, what, what PRMS says is what you choose to sell, the product you finally sell is what you book as reserves. So if you've sold wet gas, you can't disclose the NGL volumes as a separate reserves volume. Uh, if you sold dry gas and NGL separately, then you can report both volumes as reserves. Natural gas reinjection, it talks about um, sometimes you use natural gas as a lift mechanism for oil wells in order to improve recovery. So you, you would produce gas originally, then you would re-inject it to help as a drive mechanism in the reservoir, whether it be solution drive or as a gas lift. And what PRMS says is those volumes can be classified as reserves as long as you take into account any losses that you expect to incur in the process. Underground natural gas storage, this is starting to be a bigger thing throughout the world where companies are starting to find suitable reservoirs to inject natural gas when pricing environments or demand is low so that they can essentially store them there and then reproduce them and sell them in more favorable market conditions. PRMS says those volumes cannot be disclosed as reserves. Uh, and production balancing, it talks about the differences between sometimes when you have production sharing. Okay, resource entitlement recognition. So PRMS is a, a little more internationally oriented than Kobe in terms of um, talking about jurisdictions and contracts. So it has a more generic description of royalties, how they're modeled. It talks a lot about Project production sharing contract reserves and entitlements. Talks about contract extensions or renewals when you're talking, when you're looking at PSCs and how they should be modeled. So they say reserves should only be associated with contract extensions or renewals if there's a reasonable expectation of renewal. So there, and again, there's, there's a lot more supplemental guidance on this issue of PRMS, whereas the actual PRMS document has a few ones on each of these. But it does talk about PSCs and RSCs and where the line should be drawn for reserves versus essentially just contract services in countries where the government is allowing companies to essentially produce a portion of reserves for a set period of time. Estimating recoverable quantities. So this is getting into what Kogi calls evaluation procedures. So this is guidance for analytical and deterministic and probabilistic methods. So this is... Again, the PRMS in the actual PRMS document, this is a very short couple of pages on how you should apply deterministic and probabilistic methods. The application of PRMS document has probably 60 or 70 pages on how to apply deterministic and probabilistic methods with very detailed uh, examples.
So analytical procedures, these are the four main ones that were listed in Kogi as well. Talks about analogs, talks about volumetric estimates, talks about material balance methods, and production performance analysis. Again, there's a paragraph of each in the original PRMS document and a section of supplemental guidance. Deterministic and probabilistic methods. So just summarizing, deterministic just means there's a single value for each parameter selecting the evaluation, which means there's a single outcome for each increment or scenario. So this isn't contrary to the range of uncertainty we've been talking about. It's a bit of a different concept. So if you're doing a deterministic evaluation of a well, you're going to pick a single porosity value. You're going to pick a, a single water saturation. You're going to pick a, a whole bunch of single parameters. You're going to choose a value for those that you feel is most representative of the reservoir. And then you're going to apply a range of uncertainty to something like the recovery factor. So that's the difference between deterministic and probabilistic evaluation. You're going to look at every single potential outcome for every parameter. So your porosity is going to have a distribution. Your permeability is going to have a distribution. Your uh, water saturation, your fluid contact, every single parameter that goes into an evaluation is going to have a distribution and then you're going to choose the correct statistical number for p10 p50 p90 and so it's probabilistic you're looking at doing what's called a monte carlo simulation because there are so many there are literally millions of outcomes and you have to generate a distribution based on the input you know deterministic evaluations are saying you choose set parameters for each input, and then we decide a range of uncertainty once we've arrived at a reasonable answer. Again, there's a bunch of discussion on aggregation methods, arithmetic versus statistical aggregation. So if, as I talked about a little bit in Kogi, if you use arithmetic summation, you're gonna end up with a conservative P90, so your proved estimate is gonna be conservative. You're gonna end up with an optimistic P10 due to the same issues. If you try to use statistical aggregation, you can't use statistical aggregation if you've done a deterministic evaluation, so it's usually a, a boot point anyways. But if you're going to use statistical aggregation, you have to be wary of dependencies because statistical aggregation, you have to take into account dependent factors and often oil and gas inputs are dependent. Reserves versus should not be aggregated. So this is the same in Kogi. I didn't mention in Kogi, but you're not supposed to add contingent resources and prospective resources and reserves. Uh, you're not supposed to be a one lump sum number that says total resources without being very clear what you're doing and being very uh, transparent with your disclosure. So for the most part, you will never see reserves, contingent resources, and prospective resources sum in any public disclosure. And the reason for that is because of the risk associated with contingent prospective resources. The regulatory bodies and the, and the evaluation guidelines want people to understand that there's a fundamental difference between contingent perspective volumes and reserves. And so you're never supposed to, here it says aggregate, but you're never supposed to sum the different quantities without being very specific of what you've summed and how you've summed it. Uh, so I think this is the last slide. And again, it's just, it's highlighting the other documents. So we talked a little bit about audit procedures in mean, Kogi. PRMS has very similar document. It's a little more in-depth in the Kogi section, actually, on auditing oil and gas reserves information. It's a pretty common practice in lots of areas of the world, so there's pretty specific guidance on how it should be done, qualification for, for auditors, etc., uh, what type of data you should be auditing and how you should be auditing it. Uh, and then the guidelines for application of, of PRMS. So that's that's the 250-page document I talked about at the beginning that really goes into a lot of detail. It's the equivalent of Kogi Volume 2 and Volume 3. It talks about a lot of different unconventional resource types. It talks about evaluation procedures, statistical methods. It has a lot of very specific and detailed examples in it for how certain procedures should be carried.